And welcome to Twin Peaks Unwrap Time. Your host, Ben Durant, and beside me is... Brian Kazaska. Hi, Brian. Hey, Ben. How's it going? It's going great. It's been good. Having a good old time. I know. Last week we had Sabrina on. Who do we have on this week? Hey, this is Charles de la Zarica. And I'm pronouncing my name for myself because apparently no one else can pronounce it. So here we go. Hey, Charles. Hey. You're an award-winning American documentarian. You're a filmmaker. You're a DVD Blu-ray producer. I mean, you've done things with uh, like the box set for Blade Runner and Alien. And you really have done some amazing work. And I'm so glad that we get to talk to you about your Twin Peaks. I'm really excited about uh, this this new release, and I've been enjoying reading all the reactions to it. Um, it's a lot of fun. And you've been a, a fan of David Lynch's for a long time, haven't you? Can you tell us a little about like when you first got into David Lynch? Well, I think the first time I remember even recognizing David Lynch as a as an artist and as a filmmaker was probably The Elephant Man, because I was uh, I mean I was a little kid when it came out, but I, I remember seeing it. Strangely, I think I saw it. Around the same time as the Blues Brothers, like on the same day, I think wow. I saw the Blues Brothers and Elephant Man, two very different movies. But it was the first time because as a kid, you know, you see movies for fun, you go to be entertained and laugh and cheer and all that. And the Elephant Man is the first time I cried at a, at a movie. So it really had a powerful impact on me. Uh, it was such a beautiful film with such dignity and such kind of like dark beauty to it. But it was also you know an exquisitely made movie and i was just instantly intrigued by this filmmaker and then of course as you know given the, the period i grew up in the 70s and 80s you just kept seeing people wearing t-shirts with this eraser head hmm. guy on it and you start, wondering, <laughs> you start wondering what that's all about and um you know and i did and i just slowly became became interested in, in david's work and uh and believe it or not i actually really loved uh dune when it came out a lot of people love to criticize that film but i think more and more people are starting to realize that it's it's aging very well that movie and it's mm, so incredibly well made um it just you know you wish that nowadays they could maybe go back and just do a, a little bit of a polish on it technically but i i think that uh, god in terms of world building it's it's really second to none i mean that's just an incredible experience so that's kind of how I, I began to take notice of david but then of course the i think the, the one that just blew my mind was was blue velvet from that point on i, I think i understood what language he was speaking as a filmmaker and i understood what types of movies uh and stories to not not expect but like kind of how to prepare myself when i was going into these movies that, that was kind of the beginning for me cool and i heard that you were part of the college newspaper and you actually got to interview the cast of twin peaks can, can oh, you share wow. that with us that's cool i was at uh glendale community college in california and i was uh, on the newspaper staff and and again having been a fan of david's i, I heard that you know, he had a, this new TV show that was in the works. And I actually got tickets to an early screening of the pilot. Um, it was, I can't remember how far in advance of the, the, you know, the air date it was, but it was, it was a bit before it was actually on television. So I got to like brag about it for a while to my friends, like, oh my God, you're not going to believe this thing I saw. And so instantly, like from, from day one, I was a Twin Peaks maniac. Uh, I was a Peaks freak and I just uh, <laughs> loved it. And I, 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 I taped every episode on VHS. I still have those in a box somewhere in my garage. And, um, and I was really into it. And I read the, you know, the diary of Laura Palmer and I, and I just devoured that. And so in between seasons, in between season one and two, there was a charity benefit for this organization called Tree People. And it was held at Union Station in downtown Los Angeles, which is the, the famous train station where they shot Blade Runners, the police station, right? Yeah. So um, they had this party there and a huge amount of the cast was there. Uh, Mark Frost was there. I don't think David was there, but yeah, everyone was there. And they were sort of like in the, it was in the, the glow of love uh, for the show because it was between those two seasons. So uh, it was very exciting to go and completely like uh, unauthorized. I went in with my little tape recorder and I just, <laughs> I just started walking up to various people and, and 
interviewed them for my college newspaper. Uh, I interviewed Kyle McLaughlin, Ray Wise, Jack Nant, Dan Ashbrook, and uh, James Marshall, and Richard Boehmer, and I go on and on, Cheryl Lee. You know, I was very nervous. I was very, you know, <laughs> I, I felt like I, I shouldn't have been doing what I was doing, but I did, and I, and I recorded some really fun, quick interviews with all these people. And then it was in my college paper, and I became sort of like the de facto Twin Peaks expert at my college, basically. And I wrote a few articles about the show during its run. But uh, yeah, that was an amazing night. And, and, and a really quick side story about that night, they had a contest uh, to guess who the killer was. Now, mm. keep in mind, between season one and two, but it was after Laura's Diary had come out, which I had read. Yeah. And so I, I, I felt like I had a pretty good handle on who the killer was. But th the contest was basically, you know, write your name down and your contact info and who you think the killer is. And I, so I did. And I put down, spoilers, Leland Palmer, right? <laughs> and, and again, it was mostly out of the diary that I came up with that. Wow. So, and I actually, when I, when I interviewed Ray Wise that night, I, I said, and this is like the first time the public has seen him with the white hair. Um, I asked him, I said, you know, I read the diary and I think you're the killer. And, and he just kind of like laughed. <laughs> like, I'm, not, I'm not even sure he knew exactly, but he was like, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Like, oh, he was, wow. like he thought I was trying to like nail him on it. But, and so years later when I shot the, you know, the, his interview for the secrets from another place documentary, I, I told him that story that, that, that I wrote him down as the killer. And, uh, and months later they called me up and I had won, but I didn't know what the prize was. The prize was they, they, they called me and they said, Hey, you're the winner of the romantic dinner with your dream killer uh, <laughs> contest. And I said, what? And I said, they said, yeah, you get a romantic dinner with Ray White. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I told, I told Ray that story and he was like, man, I'm glad you didn't collect that, that prize. So um, that would have been very awkward, but yeah, that, that was, that, that was that event that you asked about. Yeah, That's awesome. That is an so, odd, you're going to eat dinner with the killer. Yeah. It yeah. seems so and bizarre. It's romantic too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's been a little over 10 years ago. I can't believe that the, the gold box there came out that you produced. I'd love to know how this all came about. How'd you get involved with this DVD set? You know, I'd, I'd produced several other box sets by that point, and um, I was working with CBS on this show called Numbers that was on for seven seasons. I produced the, you know, like the behind the scenes extras for that. And someone at, at CBS named Trisha Gum, um, she told me uh, that Twin Peaks, the rights to Twin Peaks went to CBS. She was like, she's their, one of their attorneys, and she says that they got the rights to it. And um, I said, great, I'd love to somehow be involved. And so basically, I wrote a proposal, and it was accepted. And uh, I was off and running, basically, off, right, just like that. You know, it was, it was just a matter of showing my passion and interest and ideas. But mostly it was, I think, having a, a sense of the show because I was such a huge fan of it and knowing it's kind of, you know, I'm not going to say troubled history on home video, but it's a very unusual yeah. history. Like who, who owned what and when and what was released in what territory and which version of the pilot and all that. So just having that, that love and knowledge of the show, I think, helped me. But uh, yeah, I was. I remember I was in New York working on another project, and I and I had to have my first phone call with David Lynch. And um, you know, again, very. I was very scared because I wanted to impress him, but I also wanted to let him know that I wasn't going to try to you know demystify or devalue the the sort of like the the, the dreamy uh, world of, of Twin Peaks. I was. I didn't want to like do one of these massive like you know film school in a box deconstructions, which mm. which gives away all the secrets. I was, I was very much about keeping the secrets as, as much as he wanted them kept. So, you know, it was just, it was the beginning of a process and I just did my usual thing, which was kind of a, it's almost journalistic where you just, you track people down, you interview them and they tell the stories and you just listen and you follow up with questions. If they, if they come up with something interesting that you didn't know, or maybe has a different take on something you did know, you, you know, you follow that down its rabbit hole and, and, and kind of figure out, okay, is that a story I need to ask someone else about? Mm. And that's how these, that's how these documentaries develop is you just wow. listen, you listen and you ask and you listen and you ask. And that was how the secrets from another place documentary kind of started to come together. And I, it's so good. And, and you got to interview Mark Frost, which I don't think in the, any of the other DVDs had anything with oh, Mark wow. Frost. And so it, was, it definitely felt like Mark and David's uh, DVD. Like, I don't know. It, you did such great work with getting the people and getting to talk with Mark. Well, you know, it was between uh, myself and my, my associate producer, Amy Lowe. It was between the two of us. We just kind of spread the, the net out pretty wide to try to interview as many people as we could. Because one thing you have to keep in mind, at the same time that I was working on the Twin Peaks Gold Box, I was also working on the big five-disc Blade Runner set. Wow. Like, wow. like simultaneously. In fact, <laughs> I don't know how much you guys know or care about the Blade Runner final cut, but, you know, we had to go in and, and redo some material. Like, we fixed a lot of continuity problems and when we shot joanna cassidy as zora in blade runner in front of a green screen to oh like replace God. her replace her face in this oh, one wow i didn't know and, that 
Well, that was shot, I think it was the day before or the day after we shot A Slice of Lynch, uh, that piece from the, from the gold box. So it was like, I was, I was literally jumping between two worlds, no pun intended, between, <laughs> between Blade awesome. Runner and, and Twin Peaks. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a really, it was a crazy time, but it was a fun time. I, yeah. it, was, it was like my favorite movie, my favorite TV show back to back. It was pretty amazing. That's something. And you mentioned Slice of Lynch, your other documentary. I mean, I love the atmosphere that you guys were in. I, is it Bigfoot Lodge that you guys filmed in? I think I'd heard. And yeah, that's right. It's it's the Bigfoot Lodge East, which is on Los Feliz in uh, in LA. Um, and interestingly, when we were shooting interviews for um, Secrets from Another Place, Michael Horse's interview was shot at Bigfoot Lodge in San Francisco. So it's kind of like this re recurring Bigfoot Lodge theme, just because it looks is a very Twin Peaksy you know location. It so it seemed to work. Did you do all the packaging and since the menus and all the, I mean everything that comes with the DVD, like besides the documentary, like you know it's it's case by case. In the yeah. case of in the case of Gold Box, um, I was very involved with the menus. I was very involved with the packaging. In fact, uh, I took a pass at the packaging itself. The back of the Gold Box I designed. Uh, because it was just like there was so much material and Ken Ross, who's the, the, the head of CBS Home Entertainment, who's just been a great friend and an ally. And he loves Twin Peaks. He's been a major defender for that and just he always fights for the best for Twin Peaks. He would often consult with me about menus and packaging and, and, and release strategy and, you know, promotional things. So he's been a great, you know, he's been very generous and very kind to involve me just to have that extra fan perspective and also someone who's, you know, been in the home video business for a while. It's like, I have a perspective that might help out in a way that others don't, you know, but um, yeah, but like in that one, I, I helped out on, on pretty much everything. Um, the, uh, the complete mystery, the entire mystery, I keep forgetting which word it is. Cause it went, it went back and forth. Yeah. A lot between, it's kind of both the entire mystery missing and the missing pieces. <laughs> and the missing pieces. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was, it was kind of the same thing. I, that one, I wasn't involved in the packaging, but I, but I was, uh, you know, helpful, you know, with, I tried to be helpful with the menus and then the same on the new set. I just consulted with Ken and he would show me things and, you know, we would just talk about what, what David might want, what the fans might want, what's good for the show, what's yeah. good for everybody. And, you know, you have these conversations and sometimes they come to pass and sometimes it's something entirely different. Yeah. When with the gold box, it was so professional. I remember getting that and saying, wow, the, the, the production value of this, just in the menus and the way it was done, it was you did an incredible job with that. It, it really was something. Well, you know, that was the, the, the thing was just trying to keep it, keep the mystery alive, um, but also, you know, set, set the stage. You know, I think the best DVD and Blu-ray menus are those that are, they're almost like the, like the pre-show at a Disneyland ride, you know, where it's not the ride itself, but it's immersing you in the world. Yeah. And, and I kind of feel like that's what, we, what I always try to push for on menus is to create an immersive experience, which just kind of prepares you. It's almost like, you know, like when you have an overture or an intermission during a long movie, it's like, this is the overture. This is just kind of like, okay, everyone's going to sit down. They're going to get ready. They're going to start to hit play soon. So get them you know, up to speed, up to up to the, the kind of like the flavor of the, the meal they're about to have. You know? Yeah, that's cool. So when we got to the uh, entire mystery and the missing pieces, how did you <laughs> get involved with uh, making the documentary Between Two Worlds? Um, well, same thing, you know, it was sort of like in between um, the, the gold box and the Blu-ray set, Ken reached out basically to tell me that looks like the there have been great progress on the the deleted scenes front for fire walk with me which is of course something i think everyone's always wanted and they're curious about and um actually back on the gold box we talked about trying to bring in fire walk with me and the and the deleted scenes yeah. but but the rights were such that it was just impossible to to swing back then so in the, in the time in between ken and and david had spoken obviously and they you know i guess they had made some positive steps towards that happening and obviously it didn't happen. It happened, I think, better than anyone could have predicted because it was like twice as much deleted material and altered material as I thought. I think even most of the you know knowledgeable fans knew. It was like there was a lot more material. It was just wonderful to finally see after all these years. And that was, you know, entirely David and Sabrina Sutherland and you know, their, that team over David's office that put that together. So um, it, was, it was really wonderful to finally have all that in one box. I wonder if I was told that it was in the works the the deleted scenes and fire walk with me to have it become a part of the box of the you know the existing gold box kind of like take that and then make it even better and uh and that meant obviously cbs and david making the show ready for hd digging up whatever content we could for instance like the uh the log lady introductions which only existed on a really muddy one inch videotape from 19, whenever it was shot for bravo um 
you know, finding the original 16 millimeter film elements and retransferring that. So it was like, it was, it was all a matter of like, what did, what do we have and what are we missing? That's kind of like how I approach every older like catalog project is, is sort of like, what's our, what's on the shelf right now and what more do we need to do to tell the full story or what is missing that fans have not seen. So it was the same thing with this Blu-ray set. And, um, and then part of that was obviously Ken was looking for a new, sort of like almost like a sequel to a slice of Lynch and that became uh, between two worlds. And that was, and that was the idea for that was just more fire walk with me centric. Yeah. Uh, because that was, sort of, that was sort of like the new component of this box set. With Between Two Worlds, did you know what you were getting into with Lynch? And there was like, there was two pieces. There was one that there was the interview talking with the cast. And then there's this this other stuff that seems to be scripted and it's a story. And <laughs> yeah, did you know what you were getting when when, when you did this documentary piece? Um, not exactly, uh, to be honest. It was, it was, again, meant to be kind of like a pseudo sequel to Slice of Lynch. So the idea was that David would sit down and just, you know, reminisce uh, with three, you know, people from, from the original, originally, you know, with Slice Lynch was the original show. And then with uh, Between Two Worlds, it was that plus Fire Walk With Me. So it was just basically continuing a conversation just with different people. Yeah. And, um, and it was the same location, just a different part of it huh. and a diff slightly different setup. Yeah, on, I think just David was really inspired um, before the shoot uh, to come up with this, this beautiful opening. Uh, that had him, you know, communicating with uh, characters, you know, which was blew my mind back then because, you know, that was back. We had no idea there was a, a season three, you know, possibly about to happen or, you know, a yeah. year or two later. So, so it was uh, it was magical to like be there like on the day and just sort of see these characters come back in this, you know, in this slightly different form. But it was just uh, it was a lot of fun and definitely unexpected. But um, I, I mean, Ken at CBS and I, we both you know, looked at each other and we knew that we had something really special mm. uh, captured and that was because of David and uh, and the team that, uh, you know, they decided to do that. It was just on the day that Lynch brought those pages, right? Wow. He didn't even give the actors any time to even know what they were getting. Well, or... I'm not, I'm not 100% sure in terms yeah. of what was the actual process of when he wrote it and oh, yeah. where, how, how it got to the, I mean, we had to like, you know, facilitate uh, them getting pages but, um, you know, it, I think it's just better to, to think of them as just living in, in the characters mm -hmm. and just sort of breathing that dialogue. And it was just like how it happened is actually kind of more mundane. It was just yeah. like being there, being there and just seeing them start into this without having any idea what they're about to say was pretty incredible. Yeah. And to think about it, like Lynch and Frost knew that they were working on another series, That's I mean, crazy. season three and stuff. So it's kind of crazy that, like, we thought this was, I mean, we're seeing the Blu-ray mm -hmm. and thinking, oh, this is the end. This is how, we, our last time we're going to see these characters, and this is Lynch's way of doing that. So it's kinda, it was kind of special then, and it's special now to see that it was a way of continuing, I think. Very cool, yeah. yeah. So, Charles, I just want to let our audience know that in uh, 2015, you won a Saturn Award for producing uh, the entire mystery there. And uh, congratulations, and that was, I think, your fourth uh, Saturn Award that you had gotten. Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. And then in, in 2007, we also won a Saturn for the, uh, the Gold Box, so it was great. Nice. Wow. Two, two Twin Peaks Saturns. Um, and, uh, yeah, at the, uh, at the award show for the, uh, the Blu-ray set, um, David sent in a really fun uh, thank you video which I wonder if it'll ever be seen, but it was, it was really uh, a lot of fun that he put some actual creative, mm. a lot of creative work into it. wasn't just a, uh, it wasn't just a, a thank you speech. It was something a little bit more uh, special. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's really cool. Nice. Wow. Yeah. So now here we are, the new Twin Peaks limited event series, Blu-ray. You're, you're involved with that. Can you tell us how you got involved and how you were asked to be involved with this project? Well, you know, to be honest, I wasn't even expecting to be involved other than just as a viewer. Um, but Obviously, I hoped that I'd be involved, um, but I was actually I was working on a project for Lucasfilm um, for Star Wars. It was it was a, basically like a featurette that played at uh, Launch Bay at Disneyland and Disney World, which is basically a you know forty years of Star Wars in ten minutes. It was kind of like a really quick wow. sort of movie that plays before you go into the Launch Bay uh, experience. So I was working on that, and I was going back and forth between L.A. and San Francisco to work at Lucasfilm. And again, Ken Ross calls me from New York. And he, and he just mentions that there might be an opportunity um, for me to go up to to Washington for maybe a week and just fill in for, uh, you know, because Jason S., who's David's documentarian on this, um, and previously, 
I, I think he was just unavailable for a very brief amount of time. And I stepped in to kind of just, you know, substitute for not, not to substitute for his work, but just to cover it because no one else was there covering as, you know, some of these key locations from the original series were being shot. And some of the, you know, like I happened to be there for Kyle's first day, you know, and that was, that was kind of an amazing moment to be there for. So I just ostensibly just went to just shoot footage that maybe Jason could use later if he wanted, or they could use later if they wanted. It was, it was basically like a camera job more than, than the producing job. But yeah, I went up there and uh, it was, again, that was like one of the, most, the great magical moments of my life was to just be on the set of Twin Peaks uh, and watch David work. It was, I mean, it's really a, a, an incredibly beautiful experience to, to see firsthand. And I'm glad I was up there to capture it, to share it with people. Yeah, I was just That's thinking so cool. as a fan, I mean, you, you had been working with, you know, these these past uh, video projects with Twin Peaks, but this is the first time you get to see new Twin Peaks and be there as they're actually producing it with David Lynch. I mean, as a fan, you must have been in awe to be a part of that. I think. Well, I mean, imagine like being basically dropped in the middle of that set and you know not having read the script, knowing nothing about the story of, of this new show, and uh, and then just trying to catch up as a documentarian to make sure you're getting what's important. So, yeah. you know, my, my whole thing was just, I just went, I set up my camera and I just rolled and I just tried to like pay attention and stay out of the way and, and kind of have them forget about me just so I could quietly shoot, you know, and not really impact what was happening around me. And then slowly, like by the second or third day, I, I, I started to piece some things together, but even like on Kyle's first day, as you, you know, when you watch a very lovely dream, uh, the piece I made, um, you see that on the same day he played both Mr. C and Cooper, you know, and, and he, and he had to like do complete, two completely different roles on the first day of shooting. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and imagine me not having read the script or being told the story, or I, I knew literally nothing about what the premise was of the new show other than obviously, you know, you see Mr. C, you see bad Cooper show up with the long hair and you think, Oh, well, you know, Bob is still, is still inside of him in some form. And you start thinking, okay, well, then it's many years later, Bob is still out there. And then on the same day, Cooper is there in his FBI suit, you know, clean cut and looking like he did, you know, back in the day. And you start thinking, oh, so this must be, you know, the return to Cooper as well. And like the, now, now we I see a little piece of, of bad Cooper. Now I'm saying good Cooper. Uh, and you start, to, you start to piece these things together. But you're, but even then I wasn't sure because in my perspective, I thought that the shots of Mr. C, a bad Cooper, were literally, I thought that was going to be the opening of the show uh-huh. at, the, at, at the sheriff's station. I yeah. thought that was going to be how the show was going to open because you think, oh, it's all these years later. He materializes in front of the, uh, the sheriff's station. Andy says, you know, Agent Cooper, we were just talking about you. Like, I, I thought, oh, that must be episode one or part one of the show. And then I thought seeing, you know, real Cooper or, you know, old school Cooper show up and run in and, you know, have to do something in the sheriff's station. I thought, oh, that must be the end of the series. You know, and like I was, I was wrong on both counts. You know, like they were <laughs> completely different than what I imagined. So that was a lot of fun to watch the show as a fan, as everyone else was watching it unfold and and realize that I was there and I still knew nothing. I still didn't know what was happening. <laughs> I know, because I was going to ask you, like, what do you do to prepare for something like this? Because you, I wondered if you were able to get access to the script. The, the closest thing I came to a script was the, the call sheets that they would, you know, send the crew every day, basically, so you knew what the location was the next day and very minimally what was being shot. I mean, it was really basic stuff. It would be like, you know, Cooper walks through a door. I mean, it's like st- stuff that basic. It doesn't <laughs> doesn't tell you anything about the greater yeah. meaning of it. So, um, no, I, I would show up every day basically knowing where I needed to be. And then I might glean a little bit about what was going to be shot. But basically, I, I, I knew nothing as I was shooting, which is not how I'm used to working. I, on past projects, I've, I've read the script. I see the schedule. I know what's important to cover. I mean, that's how I usually do it. So this time, the, the entire project was kind of in a different box for me wow. to like, figure out how to proceed. And, and frankly, I think that that gave it a different energy anyway, which is kind of fun looking back on it, like doing it, you know, I'm, I'm there's probably the, the documentarian side of me that was frustrated. Like, I mean, why can't I just do this the way I always do it? But um, looking back on it, I, I cherish it. And I think it's, it was actually a lot of fun to like be taken out of my usual routine and, uh, and have me happen to have to kind of like chase the story and figure out what it is that's happening without actually knowing what's happening or what, how it's going to cut together. Like, that's the other thing. I had no idea how this hmm. stuff was going to and, yeah. how, and do you think you, had, you probably had hours and hours of, of footage, would you say? Or I mean, you always, on all these projects, you end up with a yeah. lot more than you actually use. So, sure. um, you know, it's just, that's, that's like every movie, every TV show, they shoot, right. you know, Makes four or five, 10 times as much footage as they need. And then you have a lot of stuff left over. Um, 
but I, I feel like the final cut of this was a good sweet spot. It was sort of like it, it got the best of what I saw and um, it supported the interviews that we had. And, uh, you know, it was, I think it was like the best version of my one week up there that this could probably be. I mean, certainly, you know, you can, any, like a, you bring in a different editor or a different producer, they'll give you an entirely different thing. But I mean, I'm so glad that you were there to be able to document this. Cause yeah, to be able to see that scene where David Lynch sees Mr. C for the first time and David Lynch sees Cooper in his, in his outfit for the first time in his, in his suit is so magical, so special. Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad you were there for that. Can I, so am I right that it was just you with your camera, one camera documenting the whole thing? Is that correct? Uh, for for every day except one of my week up there, uh, it was made by myself with my camera. Wow. And then one day, one day Showtime sent a crew up alongside me, and um, it was basically the same stuff. It was the uh, the bits where uh, Gordon Cole is in the uh, the SUVs as they pull up, okay, yeah. and, and some of some of Cooper stuff outside. Um, Showtime went up there for a day just to cover it a bit, but. Um, Otherwise, it was just me with my camera by myself. Like, I didn't have a sound person. I didn't have a, you know, a PA or anything. I was just like, it was just me and a camera on a tripod and wow. just doing the best I could to get usable material. And it really works. I mean, you watch this and you would think there was five cameras on set. Like, because yeah. you, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I like technical stuff like the background, but you have this wide shot and you have the close ups and you have like, you're, you're building this great story. But if you look at it, it's like, wow, you must have had a whole crew there <laughs> documenting. You know, you take advantage of different takes. So it's like every time, I mean, beyond like the setup and the wrap and everything like that, every time you do a different take, you try to move into a different position. And then later you cut it together and it seems like you have multiple cameras, but it's really just the same camera um and it's interesting because if you if you look at the two different styles between what i did and then what jason did with his stuff mm. his stuff is so much more like fearless and, and immersive <laughs> and yeah. in your face and it's like i mean i just i sit there in, in awe of what he did and i and i, and I think man I, I it's not that i couldn't do it that way it's yeah. just that, that was that was just not the, the the hand i was dealt on this one it was like i had to kind of go in and do traditional coverage i i think i cut it together in an untraditional way but it's like I wish I could have just like been tapped into Jason's brain a bit more because I, I just look at his stuff and think, wow, that is really out there and it's really wild and I and I love it. I think it's great. And I think both really work. And what yeah. I think is really special about your your piece is you use these voiceovers. So you did these interviews where they're just the voiceovers of the actors and the crew and stuff. And can you tell me about that? How did you know you were going to do that from the beginning, or is that something in the editing process you came up with? Well, it was it was more in the in the proposal process actually because you know that was. All that stuff was shot um, in September of 2015. So basically, my footage sat on a drive in my office for, you know, a year and a half, two years or whatever it was. Oh. So, um, and believe me, that was terrifying to know I had that footage <laughs> and like, making sure that didn't get out. But yeah, um, yeah it, it just, it was kind of an organic thing that came out of the notion of let's try to do something different. Like it's by its very nature, it's still going to be a, a making of, you know, it's still going to show people what it was like on set. It's not going to be as I think um, artistic and unique as Jason stuff, but it's it's going to convey a story, and I and I love that's my favorite part of it is just telling stories. So yeah. I I feel like well, how about instead of using the usual talking heads thing, which I don't think David is a big fan of, um, you know, let's just use the voices and have them have like these kind of disembodied voices float through the piece and just kind of comment on what we're seeing, almost like an audio commentary during a movie. Um, and I thought that worked pretty well because we that way you get more even more behind the scenes footage and mm -hmm. uh, and you still get the story to give it some context. I agree. I'm so glad you brought up auto commentary because it's funny how Lynch, you know, isn't into auto commentary. We weren't able to get the auto commentaries from what is it? Se uh, season two DVD set. But this is like the closest thing we would ever get to an auto commentary. And I love that. I could just sit, put it on and watch these these visuals and hear these actors and crew talk about that experience. So that's what I makes it to me makes your yeah. documentary so special is this these voiceovers. Uh, thanks. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you liked it. And I, and I, it's something I would, I'd probably do more of more often. It's just that, um, you know, there's some expectations that come with some other projects and other studios and other, you know, franchises that, you know, they want to see the people, they want to see who's talking. And, um, in this case, it felt like it was a bit more of a dream. Uh, yeah. so I, I liked it better. as just the voice in your head, you know? Mm, um, yeah. It really worked. And can you say, did, did you actually video record them? Like, so did you have, yeah, did you video record them? Was it only audio recording of, of the interviews? Um, the ones, like, uh, I mean, occasionally, like, some of the ones that I did were 
stand up interviews on set. Like I just, it was my camera. I just, as I was, I was, I would take a break from shooting and I'd like, like in the case of Mark Frost, I just called him over and say, Hey, let's just do your interview really quick. So yeah, it was into my camera, but you know, it doesn't mean that we would ever use that video for anything. It's yeah. just, we have, it, we have it backed up, you know, or in the case of Harry and Kimmy, you know, we had them together, which on, on, the, on the couch of my house, which is really mm. fun for them just to kind of talk to each other as they're telling us these stories. So that was very playful and very, um, you know, more, more fun, I think. Um, and then others came from Showtime interviews. Like basically I was given the Showtime interviews to sort of use and repurpose. Um, and that was, you know, out of necessity because some people we just couldn't get again, you know? Yeah. So it was just basically whenever I do a project, I just, I, I don't really have an ego about where the stuff comes from. It's like, I, it doesn't have to be mine. It can come from someplace else if it's available to us, just mm. whatever, whatever tells the best story is what I think is important. Yeah. Okay. I just found the interviews very relaxed. You put him in a good place because like, I even think of something like Harry uh, Goez, he, he never does interviews. Like he doesn't want to do interviews. Yeah. He's not interested in it. And yet you were able to get him and he seemed, he seemed to want to tell a story. He, he was, he was really fantastic and, and, and he's really smart and artistic and just has a really great perspective on things. And I, I was really kind of a pleasure to have him be involved. Um, and, you know, Kimmy is always great. So the two of them combined was just, it was really a lot of fun. Yeah. Can you share anything more about working with David Lynch? Did you, did you work with him throughout all these projects? Not directly, usually. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll be in I'll be in meetings occasionally, and uh, and then obviously the shoots for like a slice of Lynch or Between Two Worlds. In the case of the new show, when I was like on set for six days, um, it was mostly just staying out of his way. He was always very nice. I mean, he always come up and say hi, and, you know, shake my hand. And I, final day, I went up and told him, I said, "Well, I think this is it. I think I'm leaving." And he just was so gracious and uh, lovely. And um, yeah, and it's like I'm not there to socialize. I'm not there to like party with people. It's right. like I, I'm, Good I'm job. there to ca capture their their experience so other people can see it later. So I, I think it'd be unprofessional of me to schmooze, uh, no. even though I, I know a lot of other people do and they probably work more than I do, but I just, uh, <laughs> I just, I just want to capture the stuff and go home and work with it. So yeah, the documentary is in a very lovely dream, one week in Twin Peaks. It's a wonderful piece of work. I love it and I think it's so good. Can you, Charles, can you share with us anything else or do you want to tell us about what, what other projects you're working on? The thing is, I can't tell you what I'm working on now because they always make you sign these non-disclosure uh, agreements. And I, you know, that's always the bummer because I'm so excited about the projects but you can't talk about it until they're already kind of out. But um, I'm working on a couple things I'm really happy about and, um, you know, this was a lot of fun. This one was special. This is probably... Um, you know, top three uh, experiences I've ever had <laughs> in like the, in the almost 20 years of doing this job. It's, it, it was absolutely um, magical. It was a privilege. And, um, you know, I don't know if we'll see any more like a, like a, a season four or anything else down the road. I, as a fan, uh, believe me, I'd love to see more. Um, yeah. But um, it was just, again, it was just such a joy to be there for this little tiny part of it. And I'm glad that uh, I got to like, you know, put together a piece that, people seem to like, you know, I love remembering those days that I was there. Uh, cause it, it was, it was, it was almost like the most, um, almost like spiritual, like spiritually rewarding, mm -hmm. um, I've had as, as a filmmaker, you know, yeah. just the, the, the vibe and the, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard to explain. And I, and I probably shouldn't explain it. It just, it just feels right. It just felt so good. Yeah. We of course didn't get to be on set or anything like that, but Brian and I, uh, this past summer got to go to the, the Twin Peaks festival. And so we got to go into the sheriff station and we get to go to these other places and you just being there, you know, knowing that's where they filmed was, was so it was magical. magical. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. I went to Twin Peaks fest in uh, 2006 to, to shoot the piece that we had on the, the gold box to return to Twin Peaks. And, um, you know, yeah, when you see those places in person, you just, you just have this instant connection to your love of the show. Mm. Um, so imagine, you know, that love multiplied by the fact that I got to see the new show, you know, <laughs> and see the actors and everything. Oh, yeah. wow. it, was, it was just like, that was, that was kind of mind blowing just to think that all the, all the way back in 1990, when I saw that pilot for the first time, all these years later, I'd be on set for a little while just to, you know, put together a little thing. Exactly. Um, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's kind of wild. So I, I, you know, I look back and I think, man, it's, it's just been a great journey. I think uh, not just the show itself and the filmmaking of the show but just as a, as me as a fan and like other friends of mine who are fans and you guys just like i, I love that there is still a like this this family uh yeah. for the show you know it's just it's a wonder it's a wonderful thing that so many other shows don't have it's so very true. true the community of twin peaks is pretty amazing 
Here's something. Yeah. yeah. Well, Charles, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, I really am it. so impressed with all the work you've done with Twin Peaks. I mean, I'm always impressed that every time I think I've seen your work, it's like gets better and better. I think. I mean, I think this 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 newest piece that you've done with the voiceovers and how you've arranged it and structured it is is really something. So thank you so much for all you've done on on the the Blu-ray and and thank you for your time. Thank you for the, the kind words. Um, I'm, I'm glad you like it. I'm glad you didn't hate it. I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it a lot. And that's it for this week. And it's been a great month so far getting to talk to all these people about the Blu-ray. And Ben, before we go, we have to mention, you can get yourself $2 off the Blue Rose Magazine subscription for the whole month of January with the code TPU. Just go to BlueRoseMag.com. And get yourself a year subscription. I got to get mine. You got yours? I got mine for, uh, for Christmas. My wife oh, got it. Man. That was one of the friends. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I am set for March. Nice. So check that out, everybody. Blue Rose Magazine, amazing. You got you to gotta dive in. You got to get that subscription. Support local writers. Support these guys. And John Thorne, he writes his essays, yeah. and I love his work. And, and there's so many more people that are contributing Scott to Scott Ryan. Scott Ryan, the man, the myth. I mean, he does some great things. He's got a great uh, music column that he does. Yeah. I really think you guys should check that out. Jo and Josh Mitten's in there sometimes, and uh, Maya's in there once in a while, and you have different people. Courtney's in there. I mean, it's a different bag of it's people. It's a great team, though. Every magazine, and that's what I love. And what I'm always impressed with is how much they're able to cram in. They get interviews. I mean, they, John Thorne, not that long ago, did the uh, the guide and stuff. So there's so much that they put in. And it's like, how do they fit all that into 24 pages? <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah. So check that out. And before we go, you can check us out at Twin Peaks Unwrap on Twitter. Like us on Facebook at Twin Peaks Unwrapped. Go on the iTunes. Give us a five-star review. Give us a nice little comment. Subscribe to us. Just look us up. Twin Peaks Unwrapped podcast. Also, we're on Stitcher. We're on Google Play. You can lis listen to us that way. You can send us an email at TwinPeaksUnwrapped at gmail.com. And you can support us by going to our merch store in our show notes. Click on the link. Buy a shirt that supports this podcast allows us to keep these episodes in the vaults and online for years to come. Yes, go to it. And with that being said, Ben, we're out of here. We're out of here. See you next week. Oh.